Good morning. How about birthdays and anniversaries? Birthdays and anniversaries. Well, I had a birthday, so y'all can sing to me. <laughs> anyway, if somebody had a birthday, point at them. Birthdays and anniversaries. Jody. Jody had a birthday? Yeah. Okay. Sister Claudia. Brother Jim. We're coming. They're coming out. It takes time. You got to have to remember. It takes a long time to get here when you get older. Yeah. Yes. They got to realize. Okay. Any more? We're fixing to sing. All right, let's sing to these today. <clears throat> Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, God bless you. Happy birthday to you. And happy birthday to you. Only one will not do. Born again means salvation. Welcome this morning to church. If you're visiting with us for the very first time, if you've never been here, if you would just hold your hand up and our ushers have a gift for you, a visitor's card to fill out. Visiting anyone here for the very first time, everyone look around. We got one right up here, Again, a couple over here, have them fill out the visitor's card and put that in our offering bag when it passes by. Any others visiting for the very first time? Any others? Got some over here on the, on the other side? One over here, appreciate that. Any others? Any others? We got some, we have Brother Nelson's got that. Any others visiting? All right, it's good to see all of you this morning. It's good to see Brother Mike Welsh back with us. He's been, he gets a four hour opening uh, today, and where did he decide he wanted to be? To be here with us in church. He's got to go back, but you remember him in prayer. Uh, he's on the road to recovery, so pray for him. Good to see uh, all of him. All of uh, all of him. It's good to see all of him today. Amen. <laughs> good to see all of you too. Get a songbook and stand, and Ron will lead us in a number this morning. About one seventy-eight. One hundred seventy-eight. Okay, get a book and help me now. <clears throat> Joy bells are ringing in my happy soul today. For I have started in that good old gospel way. Jesus has come into my heart, he's there to stay. Oh, hallelujah, I'm going home. Hallelujah, soon I'm going home. Going home, never more to roam. I am not complaining. Filled with the Spirit, I have victory within. Oh, hallelujah, I'm going home. Hallelujah, soon I'm going home. Going home, never more to roam. I am not complaining, every day I'm gaining. Sing that chorus again. Oh, Has gone before my mansion to prepare. 
Beautiful homie deck with jewels rich and fair. Soon I shall hear the shout that bids me welcome there. Oh, hallelujah. sing the last verse again we'll have the ushers come for this morning's tithes and offerings and i want you to fellowship as we sing but make sure all of our visitors are welcome yes sir and we've, it's great to see all of you on the last jesus has gone before my mansion to prepare beautiful home be decked with jewels rich and rare soon i shall hear the shout that bids me welcome there oh hallelujah Soon I'm going home, going home, never more to roam. I am not complaining, every day I'm gaining, oh hallelujah, I'm going. Sing that chorus again. Hallelujah, soon I'm going home, going home, never more to roam. I am not complaining, every day I'm gaining. This morning's ties and I want to remember Charlie Brantley's son Alan passed away. So let's remember uh, the, the Brantley family at this time. Uh, Donnie Colgan had to be rushed back to the hospital yesterday and they did an a emergency procedure. He's doing well. Hopefully he can go home today. And, and uh, Brother Gary Tim's wife Cindy was thrown off a horse and, and could have been killed. Uh, fell on her and crushed a lot of her body. She's in uh, one of the ICUs at Tampa General. So let's remember uh, Cindy Tim's in our prayer uh, this morning. Brother Johnny, would you pray for us? Well, I've heard them sing, he paid the price, and Jesus bore it all. I've heard them sing, I'm coming home and hear the master's call. I've heard them sing those modern songs and songs of a long ago. But amazing grace, how sweet the sound, the sweetest song I know. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound, how sweet the sound. 
sound, no sweeter song, sweeter song in this night found. I heard about a man with a sound of words and I watched them white, the white is still but amazing, raising sweet sound, the sweetest song I know. It was a song my mother sang in a sweet and humble voice, like music from the world above, it made my soul rejoice. It's soothing words and melodies like rippling water flow. What amazing grace, how sweet the sound is, sweetest song I know. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound is, oh, my sweetest is the sound. No sweeter song, sweeter song in this time you can be found. I heard about a fountain where the sun is on fire and I watched it white. Why is so but amazing grace, sweet the sound is, sweetest song I know. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound is, oh, how sweet the Sound. No sweeter song, sweeter song in the sun you ever be found. I heard about a fountain where the sun is on flood and washed in the white with white as snow. But amazing grace, sweet sound, the sweetest song I know. What amazing grace, how sweet the sound, the sweetest song I know. One day when our life on this earth is ended and we approach those heavenly gates, there will be friends and loved ones who have already entered and for us anxiously they await. I like to imagine that the loveliest singing will be coming from our loved one's lips and their song will explain how they made it to glory and I think that it sound like this oh the blood the blood of god's only son is the reason we stand here today it's not by our might nor the good we have done we never could have earned our own way there was only one thing that could purchase our pardon and forgive a debt we could not pay the blood the blood of god's only we stand here today one day I will stand at the throne of my father as he opens the land's book of life and I often have wondered if he would say to me give me one reason you should not die oh then I'll just look over to my elder brother whose scores have provided my way and I'll fall on my face Lift my hands in praise as I humbly and thankfully say Oh, the blood, the blood of God's only Son Is the reason we stand here today It's not by our might nor the good we have done We never could have earned our own way There was only one thing that could purchase our pardon And forgive a debt we could not pay the blood of God's only Son is the reason we stand here today. Now in these modern times, there are some who have decided that the blood should not be sung about. And so from their hymnals, the pages that mention our dear Savior's blood are torn out. Oh, but I am so glad God still has a people who of that blood are not. And just like the saints that are singing in glory, may we do this old world proclaim. Oh, the blood, the blood of God's only Son is the reason we stand here today. It's not by our might nor the good we have done. We never could have earned our own way. There was only one thing that could purchase our pardon and forgive a debt. We could not pay the blood, the blood of God's only Son is the reason we stand here today. There was only one thing that could purchase our pardon and forgive a debt. We could not pay the blood, the blood of God's only Son is the reason we stand here today.
I was counting how many of y'all smiling while we were singing. There's not many of you. I want to see them teeth, whether they're real or false, in this song, okay? I don't mean take them out. I just want you to smile. You know, I heard somebody say this. I think it was on Monday or Tuesday. Just want to remind you, he's still alive today. He celebrated last week. We, we, can't, we studied something in Sunday school I've never really come across before. But, man, I, it, was a, it was really interesting to me. In Ephesians chapter 3, Paul is explaining to the church the mystery of the church that God revealed to him. The Bible says that even some of the Old Testament prophets didn't realize what he was talking about. When the, when the Gentiles and Jews were going to be brought together, by the way, that's good news because we're Gentiles, if you don't know, to the, to the body of Christ. And he talks about that one of the reasons, one of the purposes of the church, things that God does with the church, is that he educates the angels through what takes place in the church. I'd never heard anybody say that before. I've never heard anybody. I read it in a commentary. It's Warren Wiersbe, by the way. And so he said, basically, and, and, you know, Simon Peter talks about how the angels were even curious in the Old Testament about some of the things that were going to happen from a, a redemption standpoint. And then Paul talks about how we're made a spectacle to the world and to the angels. And so the picture is that the angels watch what's happening in the church. And I told heaven, that must be why we started live stream. They're, they're watching. No, I'm just kidding. They're, but the, seriously, seriously, they are, they're watching. But here's what was interesting to me. That's, that doesn't really surprise me, that the angels would w- look down and watch the church. And what, what God is teaching, the scripture said, he said he is showing them the manifold of his wisdom. He's showing them because they saw the power of, of his creation. But this new thing, the church, he's revealing his wisdom to them. So what goes on in the church, you know what the angels do? They see the wisdom of God and the plan of God and the work of God, and they praise him for it. And I thought, you know, that the illustration that I gave to our Sunday school was that, you know, Morgan's situation was wonderful and that the Lord touched his body, but that wasn't really what the Lord wanted to accomplish through that situation. It was his daughter coming to the Lord Jesus Christ. And so the, the angels watch this, and the angels see, oh, we thought the miracle was, was Morgan. No, the miracle was salvation. And you know what the angels do? They look over to God and they clap their hands and say, that's pretty impressive. That's pretty wonderful. But that wasn't what was the most interesting. You know what the scripture always implies? It says principalities and powers. It implies that not only do the angels in heaven watch church. You know who else is watching church? Them rascals down there. The fallen angels are watching. And and the reason, Warren Rizzo said the reason he makes them watch is is so they will know that their leader, Satan, doesn't have any wisdom doesn't have any was I thought I wish we would have studied this last week because and I told our class do you think the devil if he knew that Jesus was going to rise from the grave would have went to all that trouble I'm not sure that he would have but if the angels from above are watching us today and the demons below are watching us today I think we got something to show each of them the goodness of God the wonder of God the fact that we're saved and we have the opportunity to go to heaven and that our Heavenly Father has all wisdom, and our adversary has no wisdom. And it was a blessing to me to realize, you know what? We're in church, and the angels are in school. How about that? Being educated in E-flat. What is this silence that's coming today across many churches? Where there once was praise Have we forgotten Mount Calvary's hill It used to give our saved hearts such a thrill I realize that choice I can join the silence I can lift my voice Lord I've decided that in your house today that I'm gonna praise and bless your The say, Lord, I love you. How could I be after all that you've done? They're watching from up there. Oh, it is my. 
my privilege to stand up and praise you. You love me so much, you gave me your son. Now it doesn't matter what others may do. You see, if they do not join me, Lord, I still should praise you because, Lord, you poured out so many blessings on me. The very least I can do, Lord, is give you glory because I'm not ashamed to say Join us, Lord, we still should praise you because, Lord, you poured out so many blessings on me, the very least. Oh, that I
Somebody ought to say amen. Somebody ought to lift their hands. Somebody ought to stand and shout. But they are glad they're born again. Somebody ought to shed a tear. And thank the Lord that they're here. Somebody ought to come to this old altar while the Lord is near. First John chapter 1, if you have your Bibles. Seems the last month or two, a little hot up here. Seems a little last month or two we've been focusing our attention on how to have revival continue in our lives, uh, in our churches, uh, past the month of January when we have camp meetings. I want to continue that thought this morning. Uh, Hoy's second verse says, uh, if we want revival, it starts with you and me. Uh, and so, I want to speak to you on a very unpopular subject. How about that? I want to speak to you about sin in the life of the believer. There's never going to be revival in this church. There's never going to be revival in our city, in our lives, in our nation. Until God's people deal with the sin in their lives. Uh, it, it's not the sin in Washington that's holding back revival. It's not the ACLU that's holding back revival. It's not the homosexual agenda. It's not Planned Parenthood, which is the single largest provider of abortions in the United States. 2011, 1.2 million babies were murdered. But it's not even them. That's holding back revival in the United States. The number one thing holding back revival is sin in the life of a Christian. So I, wanna, I want you to stand with me, 1 John chapter 1, and I want you to follow along what John has to say about sin in the life of a believer. 1 John chapter 1, beginning in verse number 5. This then is the message which we have heard of him, and declare unto you that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. We say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness. We lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Now we have to stop right there and everybody should say amen, right? But if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. The truth is not in us. But if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Chapter 2, verse 1, My little children, these things write I unto you, that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And he is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also the sins of the whole world. Hereby... We do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoso keepeth his word in him verily is the love of God perfected. Hereby know we that we are in him. He that saith he abideth in him ought himself also to walk, even as he walked. Let's pray. Lord, we love you. We thank you for your word. And God, I pray that you'd be with me this morning to share what you've laid on our hearts. And Lord, I think everyone here would, would agree the, the, the greatest thing that could ever happen is for revival to start 
in our lives and our churches and flow over into our city and into our nation. But God, it starts with us. And so God, I pray you'd speak to hearts as only you can. Help us to apply it to our lives, Lord. And Lord, I pray that if there's any here who are unsaved, they've never accepted you as their Savior, that they would humble themselves and submit themselves to you and make you the Lord of their lives. If there's a Christian here who is living in sin, God, I pray that you would speak to their hearts. God, you, you want what's only best for us. And so, Lord, telling us the truth is the best thing for us. And the truth, you say, will set us free. So, God, I pray that you would speak to hearts as only you can. We, we love you and we thank you for your word. For it's in Jesus' name, amen. Did you notice four times in the passage that we just read, John gives us a contrast between what we say and what we do. Now understand something, the measure of your life is not what you say. The measure of your life and my life is what we do. I believe this morning, I really do, if I were to bring every one of you up here right now, one at a time, that every single person in this room would say the right thing. But what we say is not the test. What we do is the true test. How we act when no one is watching is the true test. You look again in chapter 1, verse 6. John says, if we say. Again in verse number 8. If we say. Again in verse number 10. If we say. And then finally in chapter 2 and verse 4, he says, he that saith. And what John is saying is, listen, Christian, what you say isn't it. What you're doing behind closed doors is it. What you're doing when no one's watching is it. Do you know across America today we've never said it better and lived it worse? The measure of a person is not what they say in public. It is what he thinks and what he does in private. Real popular message this morning, isn't it? Sin. In the life of a Christian. So when sin comes into the life of a Christian, every single person here this morning has three choices to make. I'm going to ask you this morning to, to write these three choices down because I believe with all my heart, if we're going to see revival in our churches, in our country again, these three choices determine everything that happens. It's very important that you understand that what we just read from God's Word was not a letter written to lost people. It's a letter addressed to those who are saved, those who are believers. So what are these three choices John the Beloved gives to us this morning? Let me give them to you very briefly and we'll be finished. The first choice that every Christian has is to, number one, cover their sin. Cover their sin. You say, what do you mean by that? Well, I mean to act like it isn't there. To come to church and sit here and to pretend to be something you're not. You know what the sad truth is? When a person spends all their energy trying to hide their sin from other people. So what do we do? We simply cover it up. But in order to cover up sin, you got to start lying. Let me show you the pattern that usually takes place. It's, it's right here in verse John chapter 1. The first thing you got to do is you got to lie to other people. Verse 6, if we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we what? We lie. So you got to make sure others think that there's no problem in your life. you got to somehow lead them to think that, that what the preacher's talking about is nothing you'd participate in. Yet these same people go home and watch things a Christian has absolutely no business watching. And they go home and they read things they have absolutely no business reading. You say, well, I don't watch really bad stuff. All I do is I watch things that might have a, a, maybe a little bit of nudity in it or, or maybe a little bit of crude humor in it. Yet the Bible says here in chapter 2, verse 6, we are to walk even as he walked. And when you sit and watch things that aren't pure, 
things you know our Savior wouldn't dare put his eyes to. And you think that's all right? I, I can cover it up. No one will know. You come to church and maybe you, you lead everyone here to think, I, I'd never do that, Pastor. I'd, I'd never pay the cable company any money for that filth. Never put my eyes to that website. You know what the saddest thing is? If you're trying to cover your sin, your kids are watching. They're not dumb. They pick things up pretty quickly. By the time your kids are six or seven years old, they know how to cover it up too. Same sins you've brought into your home. They've now mastered. Let me tell you something, the world didn't teach them that. They're doing it because they've learned it from mom and dad. And understand why you, you can cover it up from other people. I want you to know you cannot cover it up from God Almighty. The Bible says, For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of them whose heart is perfect. That word perfect means committed toward him. See, if you're one who covers your sin, the writer says you cannot be fully committed to God. When you start covering your sin, you've got to start lying to everybody. But then the, they move to a second stage in their lying. Shortly after you begin lying to others, you then got to start lying to yourself. Because if you're going to cover it up and really keep a straight face, you've got to be able to say, you know, it, it's probably not as bad as I first thought. You know, you know, I'm not even sure that it's wrong. Or how about this one? You, you know, there's a lot of people who I know who are doing way worse than I am. And before you know it, you've got to start lying to yourself. And then it goes a step further. You're in the middle of that cover-up, and you've been lying to others, and you've been lying to yourself, and now you've even got to lie to God. In verse 10, it says, If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar. The Holy Spirit convicts you of your sin and you lie to Him and say, no, I'm okay. I'm all right. There's nothing wrong. I can break this sin any time. I've seen it too many times. People fighting the conviction of the power of the Holy Spirit right there in their seat. God wanting people to get things right with Him and they, they fight Him. And somehow they get through the first time and then the second time, and the tenth time, and the fiftieth time, and pretty soon it doesn't even bother them anymore. Listen, friend, God has promised in Proverbs 28, verse 13, that the man who covers his sin shall not prosper. Do you hear those words? Shall not prosper. Let's not sit here today saying, God, use me. God, bless me. God, direct me. God, fill me. Not until sin stops being covered up. We need to get this down. Nobody can cover up sin in my life except me. No one can cover up the sin in your life except you. Please don't try to blame other people for the sins in your life. If there's going to be revival in your heart, in my heart, in our lives, we are responsible for it. When sin comes into the life of a Christian, the first choice we have is to cover that sin. Then there's a second choice a Christian has when sin comes into their life, and that is number two, to confess their sin. See that in verse number nine. If we confess our sin, he is what? Faithful and just to forgive us our sin. What a great verse there. If we confess our sin. I just quoted you Proverbs 28, verse 13. It says, He that covereth his sin shall not prosper. But the rest of the verse says, But whosoever confesseth and forsaketh his sin, he shall find mercy. You know what it means to confess your sin? I mean, we use that word a lot, don't we? Just confess your sin. Well, what does it really mean? Does it mean to come to an altar and say, Lord, I'm sorry for doing this, but have no change of heart when you leave? 
and you continue doing the same. Say, is that confession? Is that true confession? It's not. The word confessed used here in the scripture literally means to see your sin and to grieve over sin the way God sees and grieves over your sin. That's what it means. To see your sin exactly the way God sees it. It's like when you go to court and there's somebody who's guilty. Never believe this, I was guilty of a speeding ticket. Can you believe that? You stand before the judge, you know what he says? Here's the charges against you, how do you plead? And I stood up and I said, guilty. You know what I'm saying to the, to the honor there, the, the judge? I'm saying, I confess. I see it the way you see it. See, confession is not a praying a lovely prayer. It's not trying to impress God or, or other people. True confession is naming sin. Calling sin by its name. Calling it what God calls it. Lord, I have envy in my heart, so I see it the way you see it. I need to change. Lord, I have bitterness or hatred or lust or deceit in my heart, and I see it the way you see it. And I need to change. See, confession simply means being honest with ourselves and God. That's what God really wants from us today, Christian. He wants us to see our sin the way He sees it. Because if you see it that way, the way God sees it, a confession will be made. So what would it take for you to become honest with God today? If you were battling, covering sin in your life, what would it take for you to come honest and submit and say, Lord, I am willing to confess my sin and I am willing to turn from my sin? I mean, you know, we usually have 20 20 vision when it comes to seeing sin in lives of the other believers in our lives. Right? I see your sin real good. But what about our own? I got news for you. Your friend's not going to stand before God with you. You're going to stand before God on your own and give an account for your own sins. And you may be here this morning, you say, well, for some reason I'm sitting here with an uneasy feeling this morning. That's the Holy Spirit speaking to your heart. Now understand, the devil will whisper, no, keep going, it's not hurting anybody, you can stop anytime you want, but listen, without the power of the Holy Spirit in your life, you will never stop covering it up. But God has promised, if we confess our sin, if you see it the way I see it, I am faithful and just to forgive you of your sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. How many of you know that we'll never know the fullness of the Holy Spirit until we confess those sins in our lives? We'll never have power in our lives or our ministries until we confess those sins in our lives, until we see them the way God sees them. In New York City, there's a lady who stands 151 feet tall. I'll give you one guess who it is. She holds a torch in her hand, giving light. Inscribed on the pedestal which this lady stands are these famous words. Give me your tired and your poor. Your huddled masses yearning to breathe free. The wretched refuse of your teeming shore. Send these, the homeless, tempest tossed to me. And I lift up my lamp beside the golden door. Obviously we know her as Lady Liberty. She stands there in New York Harbor and has a crown on her head that has seven spikes. The spikes... Speak of seven seas and seven continents. In other words, what she's saying is, no matter where you are in the world, you can come to America. And you can come with all your mess. And you can come with all your problems. You can come with all your burdens. You can come with all your needs. And you can come because Lady Liberty is holding a torch to show you the way to freedom. But did you know, at the bottom of Lady Liberty's feet, there's a chain. Did you know that? Show them the picture. There's a chain. You see it there? The chain, though, has been broken. 
And what she's doing is she's inviting the broken and bruised people who have been held in bondage in one situation or another. That no matter where they are in the world, they are welcome to come to America and break free from the chains of their past to find freedom. See, the same is true for you today. That's what 1 John 1, 9 is all about. That God is holding for you the same promise of freedom. No matter where you are today in your life, no matter what you've done in the past, you can come to God with your mess. How many here today can say, I had a mess and I brought it to God and God took all of it? I can come to God with all my problems, all my burdens, all my bondage. You can come to Jesus Christ. You know why? Because John said Jesus is the light. And if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we can have fellowship one with another. Jesus holds up the torch today and wants to show you a way to victory and freedom in your everyday life. But you have to make a choice. The first choice is we can cover our sin. Second choice, we can confess our sin. Then there's a third choice we have, and I'll close with this. You can actually conquer your sin. And you say, wait, 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 hold on. I can't conquer my sin. I was born a sinner. I'll always be a sinner. You know what? You're right. 1 John 1, 8, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. See, a believer will occasionally commit sin, but you should not live in habitual sin. It should not become a practice in your life. Turn over in your Bibles to chapter 3. 1 John chapter 3, I want to dispel any confusion here this morning. I've gotten more questions on this one verse than almost any other. Look what it says in chapter 3 and verse 9. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. Now wait a second, it seems like we got a contradiction. This seems confusing because in 1 John 1, 8, he says if we say we have no sin, we're deceiving ourselves. Now in chapter 3, he's saying, listen, whoever is born of God, you don't commit sin. Well, understand this. If you mark in your Bible, mark this word above the word commit. That word commit literally means to practice. So now let's read it with that. It says, whosoever is born of God doth not practice sin. Yes, you have a sin nature. But you do not have to live in sin. Stop making excuses. You don't have to be a slave to sin. You don't have to be in bondage to sin. There's victory in Jesus. We, I mean, we sing it, but do we believe it? There's victory through the power of the Holy Spirit living inside your life. You can conquer sin's power over you. Did you know that God never meant for sin to conquer you? He never meant for that. He, he meant for you to conquer that sin and control its ways over your life. Look at what John says in chapter 2, verse 1. My little children. Don't you love that? My little children. My brothers and sisters in Christ, in the faith. These things write I unto you, that ye sin not. So I, he says, I'm not writing unto you so you can cover it up. He says, I'm writing these things so you can confess them, and you can conquer them, and live a free life. Church, how are we going to tell everybody else Jesus is the answer when he's not been the answer to the sin in our lives? How are we going to tell them? How are we going to tell this unsaved world there's victory through a relationship with Christ when we are bound in sin's chains and sin's dominance in our lives? What would it take by faith this morning for you to believe his word Because not one person ever got saved in this church 
Not one person ever escaped from going to hell who didn't take God at his word. How about taking God at his word today? Let's walk in the light as he is in the light. Stop covering. Stop excusing. Stop justifying. Let's humble ourselves. Let's confess it. By God's power and God's grace and God's spirit, you can conquer it. That sin in the life of a Christian. Close your Bibles. I'll close with this story. There was a man by the name of Jim. This is a true story. Jim worked in the asphalt business. And he did terrific work. He was hired one time to go out and put asphalt over a beautiful winding driveway leading up to a multi-million dollar home. The man who owned the home said, I want you to pave this driveway, but I need it done in three days. Jim said, well, that, that's a problem because I really need to, I need to go down and excavate this, this out. And this will take about two weeks. The man said, I don't have two weeks. He said, I have a huge banquet taking place this weekend with some very important people. There's good dirt underneath. It'll be okay. He said, I need you to pave it quick and, and make it look spectacular. Jim said, well, sir, I, I really need to clean it out first right down. And the man said, no, 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 you don't understand. I don't have time for that. I want you to put in this great looking driveway. Do it as soon as you can. Jim said, all right. Boy, indeed, he said he paved a winding blacktop driveway that led up through the trees, up to this house, onto the hill. It was flawless. It was absolutely spectacular. All the man's friends came over and said, man, this is a, a beautiful piece of work. Jim himself, he said, you know, that's so beautiful. I like to take some pictures and put it on my website in case other people would like to hire me. And the guy said, no problem. Go ahead. I'll, I'll even give you a, a letter of recommendation to anyone who's interested. It's absolutely spectacular. They even took a picture of it and put it on the front cover of a realtor's magazine because it looks so great. Two full years went by. And the man that did the blacktop work, he, he got a call. It was the owner of that multi-million dollar home. And boy, he was livid. He said, you better get out here. He said, this driveway's a mess. It looks awful. Jim said, what's the problem? He said, I don't know, but it looks like it's got the mumps. Get out here. So Jim went out and he said, when I got there, I couldn't believe what I saw said, there was this beautiful, long, winding driveway. That driveway we'd shown everybody. And he said, little bumps had come up all underneath that driveway. He said, it still looked perfect, except there were hundreds of little bumps everywhere. He said, I'd never seen anything like this. What in the world could bring little bumps? He said, that's six inches of rolled asphalt. He said, I don't know what to do. All I know to do is call my father. His father was the old pro. He started the business. He said, Dad, you got to get out here and look at this. And so he did. And his dad came out and stepped out and started laughing. He said, I know what it is. His son said, what is it? He said, it's dandelions. Jim said, dandelions? The father said, yes, those are dandelions. He then asked his son, son, when you paved all this, did you go way down and get it all clean underneath? Jim said, well, well no, the guy didn't want me to. He was, he was in a hurry. The soil looked good. Father said, look around at the lush field in the driveway all over the front yard. What do you see? Jim said, it was a lush field full of dandelions. His dad said, you know, under that asphalt, it takes them almost forever to come up. But after time, they always do. The father said, hey, son, isn't this the driveway you had that picture made of? Isn't this the one on your website? He said, yes, sir. He said, son, who would have ever thought it was contaminated and you were just covering it all up? 
The son said, well, what do I do now? The father said, there's only one thing to do. He said, you can actually go to every single bump and drill a hole. And you got to pour salt down that hole. And he said, salt conquers and salt destroys the dandelion. Jim said, I did just that. And every single bump went back down. He said, I rolled it again, and we've never had a problem since. So I ask you as we close. You've been paving for months. Maybe even years. On the surface, everything looks good. People are fooled. But underneath, those little sins are starting to spring up. The Bible gives us a promise, and I want you to hear it. It says, be sure your sin will find you out. For whatsoever a man sows, that shall he also reap. You say, that's me today. What do I do? You know what we need to do? We need to say, God, right here. Put some salt on it. Kill it. Conquer it. Destroy it. Because God, I don't want to leave here covering up. I want to leave here confessing it. Seeing it the way you see it. Then I want to leave here conquering that sin. His head's bowed and eyes are closed. Maybe you're here this morning and you've never accepted Christ as your personal Savior. There's never been a time in your life where you've accepted Jesus as your Savior. Christians are praying. I've never had a relationship with Jesus Christ and I want you to remember me in prayer. If you're in that condition, you do not have a relationship with Jesus. I want to pray for you this morning. Would you just slip up your hand by saying, pray for me. God knows my heart. I'm not a Christian. I'm lost. I need to be saved, but I'm, I'm lost. Would you just slip your hand up by that saying, pray for me. Bless that hand. Any others? Any others? I, I'm not a Christian. Do you have the courage this morning to slip up your hand and put it back down? Others here, you're You're saved. Put your faith and trust in Christ, but there are, there are little sins in your life. Maybe a little bit of bitterness, envy, hatred, whatever it is. I want you to know God wants you to confess it. God wants you to come clean. Because you'll never have true joy or true freedom in your life till you clean out all the stuff underneath. I promise you, if you confess it, He promises to forgive it. Whatever it is, you say, I have sin in my life. God knows what it is. It's not nothing big, but, but it's sin and it's, it's causing problems. You be honest, you just slip your hand up by saying, pray for me. God knows my heart. Bless those hands. Bless those hands. Any others? Bless those hands. Bless those hands. I'm telling you, there's freedom. But the verse says this. If, if we confess our sin. How many would do that today? God, we love you. We thank you for those who are honest with you. We love you. We thank you for those who have already come. Others need to step out and come and bring it to you. and Cleanse it on these altars, we pray. We love you. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. As we sing, if you need to come, you raise your hand. You be honest with God. You just step forward. Bring them to these altars. Confession's a wonderful thing.
morning for the cross of Christ. Amen. Have a seat real quick. I'm going to show you a quick video.